Good afternoon. Thank you for being with us. We are going to see um, a new film by Mike Deep. Mike has been spending uh, yesterday and today with us for uh, a small program with uh, the films he has made along the years. Uh, and uh, this one we are going to see is a new film that has just been, so this is the second uh, public screening of the film. You've made one in uh, London last week, or yeah, no, yeah. well, it was shown on no. it was shown on the BBC yeah. oh. um, Sunday before last. Mm -hmm. But it's taken uh, several years in the making, and I had to stop making it for a while in the middle because uh, the prisoner I was concerned was given a parole board hearing, and so I stopped filming because I thought the parole board hearing was going to be the end of the film either in a positive or a negative way. I won't tell you which it was. Um, so it's taken a while to do. Uh, but in fact, I don't think I'm going to say very much. I think, as it's a new film, why don't you just watch it as if you're experiencing it for the first time and then tell me uh, if what I should have done. <laughs> 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 and uh, I just hope it's, uh, it's been an extraordinary experience making, unlike any film I've ever made before about a very dark subject in a very dark place, but an extraordinarily moving film, I hope, and interesting and shocking at the same time. Uh, but there you go. I'll say no more. I'll let you apply the adjectives when you've seen it. And uh, we'll be here in the end of the we'll screening. be here, and I'll be here to talk about it if you want to discuss any of the themes and issues that it raises. Thanks so much for coming. Bye for now. Thank you. Mike, this is so impressive that it's hard to talk after seeing it. Well, thank you for being the first audience to watch the film outside the UK. Sorry. Sorry. Here we are. You see, I can't even concentrate. Just thank you for being the first audience to watch the film outside the UK. It's a kind of special moment in a way. Um, and so I'm more in interested in your own response about the issues it raises and how it raises them. Uh, unless you want to specifically ask me any questions, Antonio. Yeah. Um, so when when you you met him, so you you, you were not allowed to, um, to you, you you spoke. No, no. There's no way in that no? that could happen, mm. and there's no way you can ever record anything you say or talk. But what was astonishing to me was that it was the day after he'd been refused parole. And I expected, gosh, it's going to be a difficult meeting. And I can't get over the warmth and the pleasure of meeting him. And we talked, what, an hour and a quarter, an hour and a half or something like that, uh, in the corner of a bleak visiting room. And then ironically, you have this blind, yeah. you know, this yeah. what, tropical. tropical and so it's just a continuation of that refusal to see the reality and that you can't even see this. You have to always be presented with an illusion. Uh, and it just seems to me that I was discovering the worst prison system in the world in a way because it's, it's the way that a, a rational society like the States, which it's, posits so much its freedom and all the qualities, and yet to have a, a system where, as we're speaking, 60 or 70,000 men and women are in conditions of unspeakable deprivation and sensory deprivation and isolation. And uh, what I'm pleased that happened, I managed to get a Arts Council grant from, from in England to put together an exhibition of his paintings, which I wish you could all see. And I have a brilliant carpenter nephew who made an astonishing wooden replica of the cell in which Donny Johnson was held for so long. And he, need, he even managed to put a sort of concrete surface paint on and degrade it so you, when you looked into the cell, you could felt it was being lived in. And when Donnie's mother, who is the great heroine of the film and become a close friend, 
heard about the exhibition, and the exhibition prompted the BBC to finally show the film, because the astonishing thing is that the BBC has given me grudging support for the film along the way, and only just gave me the money to finish it. And all I had is the money to finish technically and pay everybody, everyone except myself and my associate producer. And we haven't been paid anything by anybody, but it's a film that once you begin, you cannot leave. You know, it's just got to be finished. If you've got a life on your hands, uh, it's a different thing. You know, if it's just a film about Van Gogh or something, you know, if you can't finish it, well, the end of the world. But when it's a subject like this, there's no way you can't get to the end. How long have you been working on it? And I don't know when I first heard it. I first was told, of course, by my friend Steve Kurtz, who wrote to me um, and told me about his correspondence and then told me about the paintings. And as soon as I saw, saw some of the paintings and read some of the correspondence, it took me about 10 minutes to decide to make the film because it seemed to me a rather astonishing thing to try and do. Uh, and it took te me 10 minutes to decide to make the film and took the BBC home eight, eight, almost eight but, years. But when, when what was this exhibition in Mexico? That was in 2006. And, and you that, were already working in the film? No, no, I wasn't. Oh. No, that happened, it was after that mm -hmm. uh, that Steve contacted me. Mm -hmm. And that exhibition was organized by Steve, together with the person from the gallery. And there they were selling the paintings as individually framed paintings, and the money was going to this charity. But the paintings which I've got, which appear in the film, are the paintings I first selected when I went to see Steve. I took about 60 or 70 and brought them back. And, uh, and about 55 of them was in this exhibition. And there I was with Donnie's mother, looking into the cell, and she said, Amazing Mike, for the first time, I'm actually looking inside the cell where Donnie lived. And it was a fantastic replica of the cell. And I think the, the, the conjunction of seeing this cell, and then 50 of Donnie's paintings framed in groups, not individually, because they sort of play off each other, was amazing. Um, and, uh, and in his paintings, there, there's in, in, in some of them almost this round shape mm -hmm. that could be um, the sand, the earth, and it's yellow sometimes. Yeah. Um, but there's two or three that we saw where there's a, a small figure, one in the left, who's this figure. Those are he's only done one or two little collages where in fact photos sent to him have been incorporated almost. Now, there are a few photo collages where bits of paper or sort of graphic things, have, but mostly they're all just made up with the, the textures he managed to create from the M&Ms and Skittles and other things like eggshells which he crushes to give a little bit more texture. And uh, I wish I had more of the catalogues. I mean, I have, a, I have a, two catalogues, which I'll leave here. <laughs> I'll leave them with you, and if anybody wants to look at them. But I'm hoping that we're going to make a website of it in which the catalogues can be a um, thing. Maybe, actually, can I just go and pick yeah. up something? Yeah. Just, um, I'm hoping it's going to be a website. And if so, uh, you'd be able to get them on the website. And the money doesn't come to me. It comes to organizations which are there to encourage creativity as an important uh, function to, um, towards uh, rehabilitation of prisoners. But, it, but what's interesting about the catalog is it contains every painting which was in the exhibition interspersed with um, quotations from his letters in his own handwriting um, about his art and about the meaning of art for him and how he made the paintings. Also, of course, often seeing a painting with the card on which it was painted, the back of the card on which it was painted. And uh, the 
title, I wrote to Donnie and said, I want, I, want you, I want the title of the film in your handwriting, and I want the title of the exhibition in your handwriting. And so the whole thing, apart from, I had to write some kind of introduction for someone might pick up the catalog and, and so I wrote it as a open letter to Donnie, so it was a personal letter, but it was also trying to give away, I mean, give information to contextualize everything. But otherwise, I was determined to make a catalog which was his catalog, just like it was his exhibition. And what is extraordinary to think of is that every painting he's ever painted, he has never, ever seen again. He painted it, put it in an envelope, sent it to Steve or his mother, or I've had a few too, Every letter he's ever written, he just puts in an envelope. And the letters are extraordinary. It's, they're kind of page. You know, it'd be like that, page after page. Hardly a word crossed out. I mean, the power of his writing is astonishing. It's as if he just pours it straight out onto the page. Hardly a word crossed out. Some of the letters, 16 pages long. Um, and, uh, but the idea that, and when he, when he, <laughs> sorry. So, so No, 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 I, I can't. No, no, it's all right, no, I, I, I'm right. No. So the point is that, but I can't even send him the catalog because you can't send books. I couldn't ever send him a book I would like him to read. Because unless the book was sent from a library or the, the, oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, this is a demonstration of incompetence, which I, <laughs> for which I apologise. But there you go. There we go. Um, so I'd love to. Um, I'd love to uh, send him the catalogue, uh, because when he looks at it, it'll be a journey down memory lane because every single picture, every word he's written, he won't have ever seen again. And some of them are over 10 years since he painted them. And I can't think there's ever been an exhibition of a contemporary living artist which involves paintings which the artist himself has never looked at again. It's an extraordinary thought. Uh, but the great thing is that his mom, Helen, we, we're working out ways in which she couldn't bring this catalog in. So I think she's going to turn one or two of the images, and it might be this one, and put it onto a T-shirt. So she's going to wear the T-shirt. <laughs> and when she sees Johnny, she's going to undo uh, um, a blouse and reveal the, the T-shirt, which will see the page. So, but, you know, it's both humorous at some level, but deeply, deeply tragic, and deeply tragic. And the only thing we can hope for is on December the 14th this year, he has been finally given another parole. Uh, but it, it's not yet sure. Hmm? It, it, it's not yet sure as the other time. Uh, no, no. Um, no, he's got this parole hearing on the 14th. I think it's been brought forward because I think Charles, his lawyer, has been. And I think for the very first time, Charles Carbone and his mum are hopeful he's going to get parole this time. Because I think there's quite a lot of pressure on the prison system, uh, economic pressure on the prison system. I think when a prisoner is over 62, can you believe it? He's been in prison since the age of 19. And what is extraordinary when you meet him, you'd think that this guy is going to be seriously disturbed. But actually, as you're talking with him, he clearly you know, has been deeply affected by the experience, but you're not talking to somebody who is unstable in any way. You're talking about somebody who's very loving and interesting and thoughtful. Uh, so we're hoping on December the 14th that he will finally get parole. But of course, that isn't meaning he just walks out of prison and walks back home. It goes through a series of stages when they allow you out. So maybe he'll get, he'll be actually free uh, sometime next year. But, uh, but we don't know, and the prison system is so sadistic and so uh, extraordinary 
that they could bring it upon themselves to find reasons not to let him out. But I think over 60, the prison begins to worry about prisoners because they cause more trouble because they get ill and need hospitalization and things like that. So I have a kind of feeling the interest of the prison, not because they care for Donny, but because they care about their own economics and organization, those reasons might uh, give him the, uh, uh, the hope that he could uh, get parole. I just hope he does because his mum is old, you know, she won't be there forever. And if it only can have a few years together, uh, I think he will do something rather interesting outside prison. I think he'll organize strongly on behalf of children of prisoners, which he wills. Um, and so we just have to hope. But that's enough for me. I mean, in a funny way, I think they raise issues which I'd like you to take on board or ask any questions about. Yeah, uh, thank you for the excellent uh, documentary. Uh, I was wondering whether there are any plans of uh, turning this correspondence with the psychoanalyst into a book, because uh, I guess this would be uh, an incredible uh, document. Yeah, I think it would. Um, there are an awful lot of letters. I mean, Steve is not well now. Um, I think it would just have to be somebody else, you know. I mean, the, the loads of letters, there's loads, quite a lot of paintings which people haven't seen. Um, and I've got photocopies of loads of letters. And I think it could be exactly a project for someone to take on, because I think it does add a dimension to prison literature, of which there is quite a large amount already existing. Um, so yes, I hope somebody does, because Steve's letters are terrific too. Um, he was a very good writer. He is a good, very good, very good writer, but he's not well really at the moment. So, um, so it's on, if anybody wants to <laughs> take it on, they can contact me. <laughs> yes, someone there. I wanted to say I really appreciated the film. Um, I think it was really well done. I'm a social worker in the United States. So uh -huh. I appreciate it a lot, um, as well as social work kind of being a broken system, which is kind of bandied over social problems. I've had to work with youth that have gone into the prison system and just like uh, sharing music, just like small things that you really do take advantage of that bring a lot of joy for the small amount of time you get to connect with them. But I think this is great that you bring significance to his life and I really do hope that works out for him in December. Um, but thank you, and yeah, that's all I wanted to share. Well, that of course is the real audience is one seeking, is the American audience. Um, and I'm trying to negotiate how that can happen. But you, why don't you let me know who you are? Yeah, and give me, why? If, my name is Olivia Otis, and I'm from Wisconsin. Are you wearing a mask? Because it suddenly muffles the voice. I'm sorry. Um, Olivia Otis from yes. Wisconsin, United States. So kind of by Chicago, if you don't know where right. that is. There's a Milwaukee Film Festival every year in November, and I think they would love to show this. It's not going on this year. It's virtual, but maybe I can get your contact and talk to somebody about bringing it there. Well, can I ask you, um, if I tell you my email is mikedib2 at gmail.com. <laughs> All I want you to do is contact me and then, and if you put the headline, uh, Lefest, so that I know where it's coming from, okay. and, and contact me. Um, and uh, I'd be delighted to have any help you can give me or contacts. That Absolutely. Would be, that would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. No, I'm trying PBS and WNAT in New York. I don't know why they find it so difficult. You'd think PBS channel would be obvious for this film, but extraordinarily, they say the problem is it's too long and it's 75 minutes and no they say they want films of, and I said, look, I'm not going to cut this film at all. It stays where it is. Yep. But I said, if it's too long at 75 minutes, create a space of two hours 
put it on for 75 minutes and use the last 45 minutes to discuss the issues. Because what you need is this film to start a process of discussion and conversation uh, with an audience, not to be just left hanging as just another movie, because the issues it raises are far too important to be just drift off into the ether. One last thing. Um, a zip code in Milwaukee has like the highest in, um, incarceration rate based on like racial disparity of black African American males. So I think it would definitely benefit. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, perhaps one of the things is because he's a white American, it's not urgent enough. I think probably if he was a black guy, that actually, funnily enough, the issue would be taken more seriously. But what's, what unites all prisoners, I think, is poverty, you know. Uh, yes, there's huge racism in the system, and of course, a ridiculously high proportion of black prisoners. But I think what is in common to all is, similar, is the kind of childhood that Donnie had, poverty, violence, incoherence, instability, um, and, and that's a shared issue. And I hope the film raises those issues in a way that doesn't limit it um, in any way because of Donnie's color. Um, hi, um, so I just I wanted to thank you for your film, it was very important. And I just have one uh, small question. So besides all the concerns, where all the political concerns were obviously left uh, after the screening, um, I'm also left with another concern um, that has to do with him not painting. In, in the final part of the film. So I wanted to ask you, is he painting again? Um, yeah, do you know anything about it? Not very much. He has sent me two or three paintings, and they're pretty good, but it's clearly the conditions, you know, if you're sharing a cell with someone else. Uh, and I think he did a lot of the paintings in the middle of the night. Uh, not that you see much night, in a prison because I think you have fluorescent lighting continuously on. But what you do is get a greater, it's quieter because I think the noise in a prison is absolutely horrendous. And so I think he did quite a lot where he worked through the night. And I think there's the conditions of sharing a cell with another prisoner and the cells are ridiculously small, uh, would make it, just make it difficult for him to have the required concentration. Because when he was making a painting, as he describes and as Steve describes, you know, he just became completely, intensely involved. And, and often, I mean, he, it was back-breaking work, but the intensity of the experience pulled him through. And I think that's quite simply circumstances of his prison life make that difficult. Mm -hmm. And his letters are shorter. Well, I hope he finds that mental space again. I think if he gets out, he will. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but we'll never know, you know. Obviously, we'll see. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for such a beautiful film. Um, I was wondering if, if um, you talk to anyone within the, the system and if anyone was able to provide a valid justification for denying someone the right to read a book or to touch their mother for 40 years. How, I mean, I can't, I can't help thinking about uh, uh, Hannah Arendt's banality of evil over and over again and how we keep, um, as, as a, uh, we keep finding ways to hu humiliate each other. Um, it's very shocking. And you were talking about PBS in the 75 minutes that they can't afford to give for someone who's been for 40, <laughs> in prison for 40 years. It's absolutely devastating. Um, is, did you talk to anyone res responsible for, for keeping him inside during the process? No, I didn't. I, mean, I think that is something which needs to be raised as a result of seeing the film. But in a way, uh, the film became what it was. And I, I felt what I should be talking to is the people who, who I talked to, actually. 
you know, I, and Caleb Smith, I came across the book about prison and American imagination and contacted Caleb. And the first filming sequence was 10 days where I traveled more and filmed. Immediately I met everybody, I filmed with them without ever having met them before. But what extraordinarily, they were all extremely interesting and people. And Caleb was so keen to take part that he got an early morning train from Princeton where he teaches to get to Philadelphia. I met him at about 12.15, at about 12.30. We'd halved a sandwich and he was talking because he had to catch a train to go back. But he was fantastic and all the people I'd met, you know, I hadn't met Charles Carbone and there I met him and he was terrific. Um, and, uh, and I'd never filmed with Steve, you know, I mean, I'd known him a long time but you never know whether anybody's going to be able to be eloquent and articulate. I think he was very good indeed. Um, and then we found that actually we were in the right place at the right time for Sister Soul's radio program on a Sunday. And she was fantastic, wonderful. And so I think, the, I think to try and get somebody to sort of balance the argument or to try and to come from inside the system to justify it or to be challenged. No, not, 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 not for the film. I was just wondering if, um, if you'd found anything out. I mean, because it's, it's hard to imagine how... Um, I mean, one thing is the system and, one thing, and the, another thing is the, the individuals who make up the system. And it, it's hard to... The, the, there's a, a piece in the film where, where you see the prisoner, a, a prisoner looking out the window in, 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 in the cell. And it's very hard to imagine how these people keep having the... How, how they manage to close the door on these people day after day, day after day. Well, I'm told, actually, that the breakdown of prison officers is quite high. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you wonder how you can actually have a job where you're um, dealing... But they, they wouldn't be allowed to speak. No, they wouldn't be allowed, they wouldn't be allowed to speak. Yeah. Uh, but what's extraordinary is, you know, there are architects who take the money for designing these appalling places and they just accept it. They don't turn the job down. And so it's extraordinary the degree to which American citizens are habituated to this appalling, appalling system. Um, I find that really shocking. No, but you can't believe that when they wanted to, to charge him from running a business from prison or yes. using uh, a food uh, to paint and yes. charge him with the charges, so that's even kind of ridiculous, but it really happens. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's an that's <laughs> astonishing thing. Um, and he's so clearly completely rehabilitated, you know, for the last 20, 25 years. He's been a completely changed man, writing the, probably some of the best analyses of the American prison system put down on paper, and also creating these paintings, which is astonishingly joyous. I mean, that's what's striking, is they're not about anguish, uh, they're somehow he discovers some space which gives him comfort, but he wasn't allowed to put the many up on the walls. You know, if he tried to put his painting on the walls, the prison office would come and pull them down. So he wasn't allowed even to transform the space. And the fact that prisoners in solitary, a lot of them, of course, are illiterate, uh, aren't even given craft materials, all those things. And uh, so it's a system which is just so shocking. It's just amazing that it's allowed to coexist and, and as Adam Liptak, you know, in Washington was saying, he's the present uh, Washington correspondent for the Supreme Court. Uh, it's so clearly cruel and unusual punishment, which is technically, you know, prohibited by the US Constitution, and yet it goes on, and that, and now the whatever it's called, you know, what is the small caucus of Supreme Court members? It's you know, Trump appointed even more people. So the chances of the Supreme Court, which might have been before Trump turned up and gave the balance uh, towards the Republicans, it could have been the case that they would take 
up, but I don't see it happening now with the members of the Supreme Court as it's presently constituted. I'd just like to thank you so very much for the most unbelievable story, true story, and how Donnie has survived through his art and uh, his mother and uh, the rest of the family. Uh, so we'd like to thank you to showing this film to us very much. Well, thank you for uh, inviting and, me to do so. It's yeah, when, when, when are you leaving Lisbon? <laughs> Very early tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh gosh, you better go home and rest. Do you live in England? I do, yes. Where, London or? In London. In London. So yes. I'm so happy to have met you. Well, thank you very it's much. It's a pleasure. Thank you, thank you. But the, 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 this funny thing, his mum came over um, and uh, just before he came, flew over, she rang me. Uh, and she, I thought she was ringing me from San Francisco, where she'd just gone back home. And she said, Mike, do you know what happened? <laughs> I've tested COVID positive at the airport, and I'm still in a hotel at the airport. <laughs> so as I was flying out here, she, was a, she was finally gave me a call and said, look, I've, I'm all right, I'm free at last. So we had, she had to pay money to stay in a hotel at the Heathrow Airport in London, um, and she just flew out one hour after I flew here. She flew back uh, to San Francisco. But she's a terrific, terrific woman. I mean, I'm amazing. And without her, of course, that would have been the death of John, Donnie. I don't think um, he could survive without that. And then I think the transforming thing was Steve, who gave him a sense of his own real worth and quality as a writer and a person. And I think that pulled him through. Uh, and then the paintings on top of that, of course. Well. Can I? Hello, good evening. Uh, thank you so very much for this wonderful, wonderful, uh, and so moving um, piece both of life and of art that you have well, thank you. given us. Um, I have one question, a small question, well, which is you know, a curiosity and a suggestion. First, the question, um, actually, he lives for what, 40 years now in the prison? 42, Almost. I think. 42, yes. So um, his environment, his society, let's call it like this, has have been, well, of course, he was in the solitary, but nowadays, the other inmates. And my question is, do you have any idea how the other inmates have, because we know the reaction of the people outside, well, his mother, Steve, you, everyone around, you know, even the newspapers, but um, the other inmates, do they feel solidarity towards him? Do they feel resentment? Do they realize what they have, you know, who they have? Um, they probably don't know, you no, know. You, oh, they you don't think they know? They probably don't know because, okay. um, uh, most of them won't know, and I don't think... Um, no, I think, you know, he... I think what is certainly... What is tr absolutely true is COVID's caused havoc in the prison. Because yeah. uh, COVID has spread widely. Donnie got COVID and recovered, but he hasn't had a visit, and I think no prisoner in the system has had a visit yeah. for 18 months to two, a year, two years. Yes. Uh, because of COVID. And certainly Donnie hasn't had one for 18 months, so his mother hasn't, and nobody else has seen him. So I think the shared experience of yes. prison for it all has the been prisoners the outside has world. been horrible. Yes, uh, and I don't horrible. think Donnie, and I think Donnie will have been trying so hard to be an exemplary prisoner, yep. not to give any kind of hint, because the awful truth was that the reason they claimed uh, that they didn't give him parole the last time was because he'd had this f fight in a cell with a cellmate. And that's what the, prison, the parole board wanted to leap on. They wanted to find a reason to keep him in. And that's the one they used. And the extraordinary thing is none of the letters he's written, none of the paintings made, are of any consequence at all 
yeah. to the parole board members. That is not of interest to yes, them. So the very them. mechanism that has transformed his life and re rehabilitated and restabilized and refocused the whole of his um, sense of himself and his world is not ignored. Yeah. And they just yeah. want to go on any little element. Yeah, it's horrible, isn't it? And can you imagine suddenly horrible, having yes. to share a cell with somebody? Exactly. Um, um, it must be absolutely terrible exactly. anyway. Exactly, that's why I asked, yes. Mm -hmm. And now, a small suggestion. You said that her, his mother was planning on wearing a T-shirt, right? With um, one of his paintings, so that he could at least see that painting. Well, I have a suggestion. Why doesn't she dress from head to toe? Mm -hmm. You know, because they came in postcards. <laughs> so she could wear, you know, like a shirt. Could we, Maybe a shirt can take something like 20 paintings, you know, and <laughs> skirt, With you know, skirt can take, I don't know, 15 No, paintings. I think you have to be careful of what you ask, because truthfully, I didn't really want the parole board to know about the film. Because you would never know where the psychological effect might be exactly the reverse of what we might be all experiencing. Aye, but they're, go they're going to know about it, probably. Yeah, but if... Yeah. If um, not, you, uh, if they don't know it what, already. What, what I think concerns everyone is that they don't want to do anything that would provoke a negative response yeah. by anything within yeah. the parole. The ire or, of them, And yeah. insofar as they don't consider his creative achievements of importance, if they felt that actually the existence of this film and the whatever is, is um, so is of course completely critical of the prison system itself. So, in insofar as they want to defend the system, which is indefensible, uh, they might use the existence of the film and the publication of letters and stuff, which were so critical, uh, as a as a weapon against him.